Welcome again to Faith Bible Church. Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us. My name is Derek. I'm the lead pastor here at Faith Bible Church. And we're jumping into our sermon series that we started last week called Family Values. Talking about the values that we derive from the Ten Commandments and how they play a part in raising our families and creating strong families within our society. Because as the family goes, so goes society. And when we think about the laws that God created and think about the physical laws that God created. We can't, like God, God created all things. He created um, the heavens, the earth. He created everything in this physical world that we feel. The things we feel, the things we see, the things that we, we taste. God created all of it. And he, as the creator of all things, gets to write the rules for what he created. That's what the creator gets to do. When you create something, you write the rules by which that thing functions because you created it. So God created this physical world that we live in, and he gave us laws. He gave, gave us physical laws to live by, physical laws that we can't break. As much as we want, we can't climb up to the roof and jump off and hope to defy gravity. You know, it's not going to happen. We try to with airplanes, but that's even using the physics, laws of physics to fly. We follow the laws of physics. God created a world to function like that, organized. But God also created the spiritual realm. He didn't just create us as physical beings that are here physically, that, that we can see, touch, taste, smell. But he created us as spiritual beings. And as a, a spiritual being, God created another set of laws called the moral laws. And that's what we see in the Ten Commandments. God creates this moral law book. And he says, guys, this is how I want you to live your life. Because just like the physical laws, when you try to break a physical law, you realize that there's usually pain involved. It's usually, it doesn't end very well when you try to break a physical law. And God's saying, this is the way I designed you as a spiritual being to live, to follow these laws, these commandments. That's the way to live a blessed life. There's a universal law of physics, and then there's a universal law of morality. And we've been reading in that. We've been reading that through the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. So that's where we're going to be today. So if you, want, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus 20 or you can read on the screens. So and we're going to be covering the second commandment today. Exodus 20 verse 4 says this. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. So the second commandment that we're going to look at today is this one. Don't have any idols. Don't have any idols. So what is an idol? What is an idol? An idol is anything that takes the focus off God and puts it on something else. Something in our life is an idol when it takes our focus in life off of God and off of living for God, off of following God, and it removes it to something else. And I'm going to say idols in this sermon probably like a hundred times. Um, I went over it with my wife yesterday, and she was like, you said idols a lot. And, uh, and, and I'm going to say it a lot, but I want you like, to maybe make a mental focus, a mental game during this. And I know there's like, going to be a kid in here that counts every time I say it now. Um, but make like a mental play of this that whenever I say idol, replace it in your life with whatever's taking your focus off God. What's taking your focus away from God and putting it on something else? See, some of us have idols parked in the garage. Some of us, our idols are parked in someone else's garage that we wish was in our garage. Some of us uh, check out our idols on Zillow every once in a while or whatever, Redfin or something like that. And uh, I don't know if I'm the only one that does this. My wife said I am the only one that does this. But like, I'll, I'll go on Zillow and look at like the million, two million dollar houses, you know. And then when it gets sold, I'm like upset. I'm like, ah, oh, that was my dream home that I was never going to buy. But someone else bought it. Maybe our idols are on Zillow, or maybe we look to Wall Street and our idols are in the stock market. Right now, that's not doing too great. Maybe our idols are political parties or politicians themselves. 
What is the idol in your life that is taking your focus off God and putting it on itself? And back in the Bible days, when this was written, there was a few idols in, ex- in the time of Exodus. And uh, those idols were actual graven images, but they all stood for something. There's three main idols 3,000 years ago um, that, they, that they would worship. The first one we may have heard of, it's called Baal, the idol of Baal. And Baal was the god of sex and immorality and seduction, lust. That was Baal. Then there was this god called Mammon. And Mammon was the god of the material, the god of money, the god of things, possessions. Then there was this god called Moloch, and he was the god of war, the god of violence. And these were worshipped thousands of years ago, 3,000 plus years ago, they were worshipping these idols, and not much has really changed over the last 3,000 years. See, in society, we still worship sex, money, and violence. We might not have a physical statue, of those, but they're represented every day in the content that we consume or the content that we go after, the movies that we go watch. They're buried in the motives for the decisions that we make in life. These idols are present. God starts the Ten Commandments with these two commandments for a reason. Last last week, saw God is, is God. He's the only God. Don't worship anyone else today. Don't make any uh, graven images. See, God establishes right away that the way to live a good life starts with recognizing that God is God. And he is God alone. It's like we're going to start these whole commandments with two of the commandments realizing that I am God and I don't want you to worship anybody else. In Deuteronomy 4, 16, it says, so do not corrupt yourselves by making an idol in any form. And uh, Moses is teaching in this passage, he's like, hey, you don't understand when, when you make idols, when you create idols in your life, when you start worshiping something else, you're hurting yourself. Don't corrupt yourself. You're, you're damaging yourself. You're not making your life better. For your own good, don't corrupt yourself by making idols in any form. So why does God want us to be careful of idols? Why does he give us this commandment? And I'm going to go through that today. We're going to look at the dangers of idols, how we can tell where they are in our hearts. The first one I want to look at today is that idols will always let you down. Idols guaranteed will always let you down. Jeremiah 10, 14 through 15 puts it this way. The whole human race is foolish and has no knowledge. It's a very encouraging verse right there, Jeremiah. Sounds like he watches TikTok or something. But the whole human race is foolish and has no knowledge. The craftsmen are disgraced by the idols they make. For their carefully shaped works are a fraud. These idols have no breadth or power. He's saying they're not alive. They're dead. These idols are worthless. They are ridiculous lies. On the day of reckoning, they will all be destroyed. And he's getting down to the root of these idols. He's saying every idol is a lie. That's its power. The power that comes from an idol is based on this ability to deceive. And usually when we chase an idol, we think we're going to get something good out of it. That's why we chase it. And I remember this phrase that someone told me, this quote a long time ago when I was a kid, and it stuck with me, but they said that sin will always take you farther than you want to go, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And that's the definition of an idol right there. It's going to promise you something, but it's going to take you farther than you want to go, and it's going to cost you a lot more than you wanted to pay. And uh, I used to be a salesman in college, and I'd sell solar door-to-door. It was a great job, and uh, not really. It was awful, but um, I I got taught how to become a salesman, and and that's why I quit. I hated being a salesman, but one of the things that they told us, they tell us, they said, never over-promise and under-deliver. Never uh, over-promise and under-deliver. So where you you say, hey, I can give you all of this. I can give you the world. I promise you this, but then in reality, what you end up with is, is nothing. Something so disappointment, disappointing. But you've already signed the paper, so it doesn't matter. And why do you think companies hire beautiful models, right? I mean, the, the, when you go shopping online to go buy clothes, they're put on these beautiful people that have airbrushed faces and their hair is perfect. And they look great. And you're like, oh, man, if only I had those clothes, I would look like that model. And then we buy them, of course. And they show up. And we put them on, and we look in front of the mirror, 
and we're like, is this even the same outfit? Like, what's wrong with my body? And uh, <laughs> maybe that's just me. I don't know. But uh, that's a sales tactic. They're deceiving you. They're using these beautiful models to promote this thing that's saying, hey, if you have this, you can look like this person. So how do idols usually look? They look like this. If only. That's what idols usually look like. If only. And you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. If only I had this in my life. If only I looked like this. If only I made this much. If only I was promoted to this level. If only, and if only, then, then I'll be fulfilled. Hey, then I'll mean something. Then my life will have value. That's an idol. If only. Your idol that you think will bring you that fulfillment, that happiness that you finally sought after, will always, every single time, disappoint you. That's a guarantee. That's the promise of idols. They will always let you down. So idols, the first thing, warning about idols is that they will always let you down. They'll always disappoint you. But also, idols want to control us. So the second danger of idols is that they will want to control us. 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul's teaching this church at Corinth, and he tells them this. He says, you know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along and worshiping speechless idols. And he gives this little phrase here, led astray and swept along. And um, sorry, my iPad just crashed. Uh, but he uses this phrase, led astray, and, and I want to look at that those two phrases, led astray and swept along, because they mean two different things. See, swept along has this idea, like we've all seen in, uh, in the hurricane that just came through, of control. That when Hurricane Ian, and we saw on the, uh, the pictures on, online, and, and you saw like the surge come in, you know, and, and it's pretty, it's amazing to see a 12-foot surge come through a town and just completely decimate it. And everything in its way is just swept along. Everything in its way is thrown aside. There's nothing that can stop it. It's, it's totally in control. And, uh, and I used to go surfing down in, in uh, California, and, and I'd have this longboard. And, and some days when I'd go out and the surf was really strong and you're just trying to pedal, you're just trying to paddle out. And it, and it felt like it was impossible. You're just paddling as hard as you could, but you can't fight the current. And that's what Paul's t- saying. He's like, these idols, they're carrying you along like this current that you can't fight. You don't have any control. That's what idols do. This idea of being swept along without control has another term that we use today. It's called addiction. And so many people battle addictions in so many different ways. There's the addiction of sex, of work, the addiction of laziness, fear. Social media, fitness, approval of others, sports, hobbies, so many things besides just substance abuse. A lot of times that's how we think of addictions. Well, I'm not addicted to anything that really harms my body, but we're addicted to something else. We're addicted to social media. In fact, so many of us are so addicted to an idol in our life that we no longer recognize it as an idol. It's been there for so long. It's been buried there. We've been okay with it being in there for so long that we don't even consider it an idol anymore. See, he says that idols sweep us away. They control us. They try to cause us to, to be addicted to them, to change us. Then he says this also. He says that they lead us astray as well. And there are two different meanings here between um, carried away and led astray. See, lead ast- led astray means this, that we lose perspective. It means that when an idol starts to control us, starts to change us, we, we are lured away from what is right. And we easily find ourselves uh, finding excuses for why the ends justify the means. And so uh, maybe at one point in our lives we're like, man, I would never do that. I would never say that. I would never uh, treat somebody like that. I would never go that direction with my life. But then as we let idols infest our heart, as we start being changed by them, they start controlling us. They start leading us astray. And then they start changing our perspective. And finally, we find ourselves over in this spot where we said, I would never be there. I would never do that. And then we look back and we're like, what happened? 
How did I get here? It's because idols lead us astray. And idols, this, this looks like the, uh, the degradation of values in our life. When what we thought was valuable, what was a conviction in our heart is no longer worth it. We don't find the value in that anymore. Maybe a, a promotion became so important that it meant, it meant forsaking your family. It meant neglecting your family. Or, or maybe uh, for a profit motive, suddenly lying wasn't that big of a deal. Maybe breaking a promise wasn't that big a deal anymore. It's a degradation of values. That's what leading astray means. And idols always look, idols will always lead to the degradation of integrity in our lives. So idols want to control us. And then lastly, idols want to change us. They'll always let us down. They want to control us. And then they also want to change us. Psalm 115.8 says this, and those who make idols are just like them, as are those who trust in them. So we make idols in our lives, and then what happens is our idols end up making us. They end up changing who we are. And that's the danger here. That's why God's like, hey, you guys, be super careful of these idols that you're allowing into your life, because when they're on the throne, I'm not. They're making you. And we change the potter now, God, who, who wants to create us in, into his image, and now we start being changed by this idol instead because we put it at a, as a God in our life. And there's this story of a man in the Bible called the rich young ruler, and he goes up to Jesus, and many of us have heard this story. He goes up to Jesus, and he says, hey, Jesus, you're, you're the super popular guy right now. You got thousands of, of followers, and you got disciples and people who just love you. I want to follow you. I want to join in. I want to join the crowd. I want to see what this is all about, God. What do I got to do, Jesus, to follow you? And Jesus looks at him and he says, okay, take everything you own, sell it, and give it to the poor. Then you can follow me. The Bible says that that young, rich ruler went away disheartened, disappointed, because he was really wealthy and he didn't want to give it all up. And Jesus isn't giving us a formula here for everyone wants to, that, that wants to follow him. But what he is saying here is he went straight to the idol of that man's heart. See, Jesus saw straight to his heart, and he said, hey, you can't follow me. You can't have me be the God of your life when you got something else on the throne already. you got to dethrone that idol first before you can follow me. So what is Jesus if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus, and you went up to him and said, Jesus, what do I got to do to follow you? What would Jesus ask you to give up today? What's that idol that's leading your life, that idol that's on the throne that Jesus is going to ask you to give up? Is it a relationship? Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a sinful habit. Maybe it's apathy. What is it that God wants you to give up in your life. If you can't let go of something that God wants you to give up, then you don't own it. It owns you. That is an idol that has control over you. And you ever wonder, like, when you go to Costco and uh, spend, like, anyway, you know, is it impossible? I don't even know if it's possible to spend under $100 at Costco. Like, every time you go to Costco, it's, like, at least $100, right? And you go to Costco, it's like, oh, it's not that big a deal, I guess, $100, you know? But then you, like, go to give $100, like, away to a church or, or to someone who's poor and even, like, less than 100 like, 10 bucks in your wallet and some guy is needing money for something. You're just like, oh, man, you like, might as well be $1,000. It's so hard to give it up. But then when we want to buy something for ourselves, it's so easy. And, and I heard this story about a family who's going home from church, and the dad was kind of complaining in the car. He was like, you know, the sermon was too long, which, you know, here, we don't have to deal with that. Sermon's never too long, right? The music was too loud. The room was too hot. He was griping and complaining, and his son from the back seat said, Dad, I don't think it was such a bad show for just a buck. And that's all the dad had given. And that's how sometimes we treat giving. It's like, oh, it's so hard because it's become an idol. Because when God says, hey, give of your time, give of this, it's hard. And if you want to discover what your idols are, try giving them away. Try letting them go. See if you can. 
Or do you live your life with open hands or closed hands? And there's this uh, part of Indiana Jones and the, and the uh, Holy Grail, you know, and uh, for all you older people that have seen that movie, I know the young people are like, what are you talking about? But uh, the, the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones, and he, uh, he's searching for it, and they find it at the end, and with this woman that's been searching her entire life to find the Holy Grail. And at the end, like, the, the thing opens up, and, and she's like, she has to choose between life or death, and she chooses to grab the grail rather than save her own life. And she dies. And it's amazing. That's kind of how we treat idols in our life. This is the danger of idols. We'd rather hold on to our idol than save our own selves. And our idols ultimately will lead to our own destruction. That's why God is warning us. He's like, guys, this is the law, the spiritual law. I want you to live amazing, abundant life. It's not to, it's not to hold you back, but it's to help you live a blessed life. Don't do idols. Idols want to destroy us. So he says, don't worship any idols, but then also he says, only worship God. He says, you must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. In Romans one twenty five, the Bible says this, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served all the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of of eternal praise, amen. So some of us might not have like an idol, uh, a physical idol, but we, but we have someone else that we worship. We worship the creator rather than the creation. And a lot of times in our lives that looks like another person. Or maybe it looks like uh, some people in society worship Mother Earth. Or some people worship uh, the universe. That's, that's a good one, right? Very vague. Or the sun or the moon. Or where they worship the stars and planets through astrology. We see people worship trinkets and statues and even crosses. People worship things. And God addresses this desire to worship physical objects. He doesn't want us to do it. And so why do people, why do we have this attraction towards worshiping physical objects? And I think it's because humans have a desire to put God in a box. We have a, a desire to try to understand, to, to put God into a single location. Like God is only in this statue, or he's only in this little trinket. Or how about this one? God is only in the church building. And we, as Christians, sometimes create the church building as almost this box that we show up on Sunday. And we're like, all right, I got to dress nice. I got to talk right in the church because that's where God is. We've almost made the church an idol to contain God to one single location. Because by creating an image, we have this, we've created something that it's less imposing, it's less threatening. We can still live the way we want, but there's still a God in our lives. See, humans like to think that we're in control by boxing God up in an idol, but we're not. We also limit God's power to, or God's presence to a building, but then a lot of times what we do is we limit God's power to a single object as well. And we do that sometimes through the Bible. We say God was powerful back in the day. He was powerful with the children of Israel. He was powerful with the apostles and they did amazing things. But today, I don't know. It doesn't really have a lot of power in my life today. So we box God up into the church and we box his power up into the Bible. And we try to limit God to what we think our idea of God is. And instead of man being made in the image of God, we try to create an image of God that fits our lifestyle. And now the God that I worship is a God that he's cool with how I live my life, but I, I come and I still feel good and worship him on Sunday. We say, I just want enough God to bless me, but I don't want him to run my life. And really what we want is a glorified genie, not God. That's what we want. So we make idols to try to limit God's power and location, but also we try to control God. And many people want a God they can manipulate. And what does this look like? It looks like, hey, God, I've lived my entire life for you. Hey, I followed your commandments. I lived a good life. I'm a good person. So you can give me what I want. We try to blackmail God. Or God, I don't deserve this because... 
I don't deserve this because I followed you with my life, because I'm obedient to you, because I worship you. We can't control God. We never can. All we can do is worship him. And the cool thing is, is that's all he wants from us. God just wants us to worship him and to love him. That's why it's the greatest commandment. What is that? Love God. That's why he put it twice at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. I'm God. Don't worship anyone else. Worship me. So how does worshiping God benefit our life? Two things happen when we start to worship God. First thing happens is we we find fulfillment. We find genuine fulfillment. Psalm 37, 4 says this, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. God wants to give you. He's a good father that wants to fulfill us, that wants to make our life abundant. That's why Jesus said he came. I came to give you life and that you might have it to the fullest. Other translations say that you might have it super abundantly. That's the life that God wants for us. He wants to fulfill those, our heart's desires. And so many people spend a large portion of their life seeking fulfillment in other things besides God. When he is the only one that can freely give it to you. We find fulfillment when we start worshiping God with our lives. The second thing that happens is we start finding freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from, number one, the approval of others. The fear of man. Codependency. Whatever you want to call it. It's a freedom from living life trying to please and earn approval by everyone. In social media. In in other areas of our lives. When God is the only one we worship, he becomes the only one we care about pleasing. And it frees you. Because living a life to please other people is is a hard life. Because you'll never, you'll always disappoint. We're human. We will always let people down. But when we start living for an audience of one, he becomes the only one that we try to please. So we're freedom from the approval of others. We find freedom from our past mistakes. We find freedom from our guilt and shame of the past of sins. God says that he's covered our, sent our sin as far as the east is from the west. When we become a follower of God, when we worship him with our lives, we are free from our past mistakes. And thirdly, we are free from the control of idols. We are free to break those chains that these idols have wrapped around our life. We can no longer be shaped by them, but we become being shaped by God when he sits on the throne. So in reading the Ten Commandments, this one is probably one of us that we would say we don't really struggle with. You know, we say, do not kill, do not steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't covet. You know, honor your mother and father. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Honor, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. You're like, yeah, you know, I struggle with maybe one of those. But then the last two, worship God, don't have any other graven image. Like, I, I don't really, I mean, I don't have a shrine in my basement. I don't really have a little idol that I worship. I'm, re- I'm pretty good at that one. But what about the idols in our hearts? I, I was reading this book called The Gospel Trees, and it's a great book. I recommend it. And they talk about how the, the heart is an idol factory. Our heart is continually making idols. Or are you subconsciously putting God in a box called the church? Do you really worship him and him alone? Is he the God of your life? And do you know who God really is like? And if you don't, look to Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is the visible image of an invisible God. So so what is God like? He's like Jesus. Jesus is God. So as we work to build strong families... And as we want to have these values instilled in our families, I want a strong family because as the family goes, there goes society. And I want, to, I want to build this strong family. What do we have to do is we have to check these two areas. One is we have to put God first in every area. And the second is get to know the real image of God. And we get to know God.
by getting to know Jesus. So how are you doing on that? How are we doing on keeping that commandment? I know for me, as soon as in my heart I find an idol, I, I, I try to destroy it, remove it from my life. Not a, as soon as I try to destroy it, as soon as I remove it, another one creeps up. And it's a continual process in our Christian life because constantly Satan, constantly our flesh is trying to dethrone God and trying to establish another throne in our lives. Is God on the throne of your heart today? As I pray and as I close, I'm going to ask you, whatever it is, that idol that's come to your mind, maybe it's multiple item, I, idols, whatever it is, I pray that you will give that to God, that you'll dethrone those idols, that you'll start the process of clearing out your life of these false idols. Let's pray. God, thank you for the Ten Commandments. Thank you that you gave us a guidebook for how to live. And I pray that you will encourage our church today, that everyone sitting in this room will be encouraged, that there is a life that is fulfilling, there's a life that is abundant, and it's not out of their reach. It's a life that you promise those who love you and keep your commandments. God, we love you. I pray that you'll give us the courage, give us the, the power of the Holy Spirit to start dethroning these idols in our lives. God, we give you the praise and glory for everything you do. We love you. Pray these things in your name. Amen.